Wally in 1940. Who is it? Waldo in 1940. Oh, yeah. He had pretty hair. Mm -hmm. That's my brother. As romantic as artists and photographers like to be with their materials, every single important technological innovation in photography has, since the introduction of dry plate, been connected to photography's amateur market. What the dry plate did is it meant you didn't have to pull a wagon train behind you, sensitize your glass plates on site, photograph, and then process that plate on site. It meant you could take a plate sensitized in the factory and then photograph with it and then it would hold a latent image that you can develop out later. The head of the Yale School of Photography until recently, Todd Papa George said, with the introduction of the dry plate, photography became more like poetry and less like carpentry. Less an artisanal practice, but more, more an amateur practice. I guess probably the only thing I don't like to photograph is weddings, because I don't want to be accused of ruining somebody's wedding. <laughs> but I, I like uh, outdoor landscapes, I, and I tend to look for the natural abstraction of something, okay? Uh, for example, this courthouse shot at night, and the courthouse is lit with Christmas lights. And it's, and, it's, and it's kind of an abstract image. You know, I got another shot downstairs that, that's not so abstract, right? And I like this one better. When I really got serious about photography this last time, I had a, a nice 35 millimeter camera, but obviously it had some limitations, so I started reading up, you know, on Edward Weston, and a lot of the great photographers, and I noticed that they pretty much always used large format cameras. So I started learning about large format and what it could do, and I said, okay, let's see if we can get one, and went from there. This one is a 7x17 view camera. These were called banquet cameras because originally they were used to take uh, panoramic aspect ratio pictures at big gatherings, banquets. Here's a 7x17 film holder, 17 inches long and 7 inches wide. Well, this is an 8x10 Deerdorf view camera. And Deerdorfs were made for a good 50 years, uh, starting in the 1930s, ending in the 1980s. They were made in Chicago. And they were pretty much the standard for commercial photography for all those years. You know, all your commercial photographers probably had a Deerdorf very similar to this that they used a lot. It takes a significant amount of time to set it up. So uh, you're not going to shoot pictures of your uh, toddler grandchildren running around the living room with it. And you're not going to go out and shoot a sporting event or something like that. Uh, but just about anything else, as long as you can stay in a stationary position and whatever you're seeing is not changing rapidly, it'll do. Finally, we have the Canon A1, which was the first camera that used any kind of electronic controls. This one had automatic exposure, didn't have automatic focus, so I had to focus manually, but automatic exposure in the aperture priority mode, and it worked very well. And that's your father's? Yeah, this was my father's. This was the last camera he bought, and he bought it in 1977. And still works quite well. This is kind of what spurred me into photography again. It's when my mom handed me this and said, you better take it. No, this, that's, this me, that's me, Mike. Well, that's you and me and the three kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I said, Papa. There's something called dynamic range, which is the range of values that a digital sensor or a piece of photographic film can actually store or reproduce and then represent. And in photographic film, that part of especially the highlight end, the very brightest part of the world, 
that information holds remarkably well when you're dealing with film as a substrate. You can recover it, especially digitally, by digitally recovering it from the film through scanning, digitization. If you're using a digital sensor, that information goes bye-bye. It's gone. The idea of sensor size is related to film size. I can shoot with 4 by 5 inch film, and the original is so large that the degree of enlargement when I make a print very, very big is less and therefore more resolute. Sensors in larger sizes cost about as much as a down payment on a house. The larger negative image you have, it's just like with digital, the larger sensor you have, the more information you have in your image. So an eight by 10 negative, okay, has a lot more information in it than one 35 millimeter negative. Matter of fact, notice this. One sheet of eight by 10 film and one roll of 35 millimeter film are the same number of square inches. How about that? <laughs> My understanding of this medium has always been material until the digital revolution. What we're talking about, I think, is a lot of dematerialization. The issue with not having a physical material thing is that at any given moment your information can just disappear. You know, I got the proverbial shoebox full of negatives and prints that have been tucked away for years. And not all of them are a treasure by any means. There's the usual family picnic pictures and family vacation pictures, but but then you, you find something like this. I mean, this is, this is really a piece of the family history. Um, this, this car that our grandfather built, and my mother wrote on the back, it said 1918, 1919. So that was even built before my father was born. I worry that storing the digital images on a computer drive, how's that going to be seen 50 years from now? Oh, this is a run kettle clam. <laughs> this is the run kettle clam. Look at that. Look at that. He looks like a monkey. <laughs> the way we get content is no longer a material form. And for people who know no different, 18 to 20 or 15 to 25, it's not as big of a problem. That being said, there are also a lot of benefits to digital archiving and storage, the ability to access certain things very quickly, the ability to have very sort of efficient means of um, tagging, you know, things like that. One of my friends uh, who is a digital photographer recently bought a 35 millimeter Leica. And the reason why he bought it, he said, you remember when your grandparents died and there were boxes of photos to go through? and maybe you might find negatives. It's like, are our kids, are our grandkids gonna go through our old hard drives? Are you gonna even be able to use that computer drive, you know, 50 years from now? I don't know. I kind of doubt it. <laughs> I really do. A lot of people have adopted a kind of hybrid process. For instance, I shoot large format film, but then I digitize that film. I create a bitmap out of it, and then I print it via inkjet. So I think what you're seeing is a lot more sort of hybridization. At eight by 10, uh, it's, it's, it's gotten real expensive, uh, prohibitively so for me. So like a box of 25 now costs darn near $100 or more. So that's four, five, six, eight dollars a shot. Uh, the four by five film, that, that's still reasonably priced. You know, I, I, could, I could afford to stay with this. Um, but um, all in all, you know, going to digital just started making more sense. I think using the large format view camera taught me how to compose better than I had with, say, the 35 millimeter. Okay, uh, it forces you to slow down, but it just it just simply you, you get a big image that you can really look at and look deeply at, and so it taught me how to compose better. 
right? So now I apply that using the, the digital SLR. There are still uh, very good reasons to shoot film. Um, and they're not primarily tied up in resolution or color rendition. The ability to actually observe what you've made on the preview screen immediately after you've made it is to me a huge change. There's something so important to the latent image. That period of time between when you've made the photograph and when you see it. If the picture you make does not conform to your idea in your head, you'll delete that. And therefore, maybe the best thing you've ever made. It's really apparent why in the commercial business, going to digital because it allows faster production, allows more accurate production, and you show your customers what they're going to get immediately. Uh, you can't do that with large format. All right? You can't do that with film. Photography will always be in a sort of art ghetto by itself because the conditions of a photograph's making are very hidden because we have this very specific document it seems so self-evident. So it depends on how you understand the artist's hand. Is it a mark, brushstroke, a gouge in a piece of stone, or is it an idiosyncratic arrangement of objects within a box, which is what photographs are? Is it the way one curates the world in sometimes very unexpected ways? If you're open to the latter, then it doesn't matter what you use, digital or analog. There's artistry in the composition and the shot. There's artistry in the production of the final image. But either process, whether it's analog or digital, allows that and allows a very wide range of it. I remember when old Azo contact printing paper, the very paper that Walker Evans used, uh, went from double weight to single weight to gone. It's been a slow death, and I think it's, I think we'll evolve.